welcome to the last session. So, you won. It was a challenge. But you've got your judgment in front of you. The loser pays. Job done. The celebrations start. The loser doesn't pay. The session this afternoon. Don't give up. We all like challenges. You steal yourself for the next challenge, which of course requires laser focus as you asset trace across borders, maybe asset tracing across the blockchain. To enforce a judgment requires a lot of know-how. Let me give you three quick examples. You may have no time to celebrate whatsoever because in some jurisdictions, for example, China, it requires foreign judgments to be enforced within two years. In New York, it's 20 years, so maybe you can celebrate, celebrate a little longer. Another example, in some jurisdictions, you have to give security for costs to try and have your judgment recognized and enforced. In other jurisdictions, you have to pay a percentage of the court fee, of the judgment as a court fee. That could be a bit stingy. In many jurisdictions, there will be a defense to trying to get the judgment recognized because you didn't have jurisdiction in the first place or you didn't serve properly. All those technical arguments. You need to know what's in your toolbox. You need to know what the court in various different jurisdictions around the world can do for you, because you may need to forum shop. In some jurisdictions, they'll allow injunctions post-judgment. The English courts, of course, have got heaps of tools in our toolbox to help in that respect. The US, US 1782, it allows us to go over there and to get disclosure from US entities including from banks, if you can tell that some of the transactions have been done by dollars. So there's lots of tools in your toolbox to try and help you enforce your paper judgment. But like all things, things change. Nothing changes the same. And that's, of course, why you always need to be on top of your game and keep up with the innovations. And our English courts are proving to be very agile and very innovative. So, for example, let me give you two very quick examples. Uh, they've recently published um, rules to allow enforcement across the blockchain of disputes in respect to crypto assets and disputes that are on the, in respect to the blockchain. And secondly, our courts, after a long technical argument that went on for really quite some time, and you may say, what was the issue? But they've decided that crypto assets are property. Why is that significant? It's fantastic, because of course, we are only going to see more and more and more um, of, of this, is that it means you can freeze, you can get disclosure, you can get seizure against your judgment debtor, but also against third parties like uh, exchanges. And that was done earlier this year, where the courts allowed uh, a, a judgment to be enforced against an exchange because they had about three million of assets belonging to the judgment debtor that wasn't being paid. So all of that is a quick intro to say, of course, you've got your judgment, well done, but it may not be job done. It may be yet more challenges. Hence, uh, enforcement can be complex, it can be challenging, it can be expensive, it can be time consuming, hence enter uh, enforcement funding, which is what we're going to talk about in the next 38 minutes or so. A business opportunity, as the last panel said, question mark. So I'm Jane Colston. I'm a partner, uh, a litigation partner, as you may have guessed, um, uh, at Brown Rodnick. I've been doing this kind of litigation, including getting judgments, as well as enforcing them and getting injunctions for nearly 30 years now. Um, during COVID, I was doing search orders and imaging orders, things of that sort, in order to enforce a £450 million judgment. So, I am very privileged to be chairing this last uh, session uh, before you all, thanks for being here, and this amazing panel. Let me introduce you to them. We're going to see enforcement from four different perspectives. So, from a funder, 
from an investor, from an investigator, and from a global broker. Let me introduce each of them. So to my immediate left is uh, Neil Barnett, founder, my immediate right, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, my immediate right is Neil Barnett, founder and uh, chief executive of Isotoc, a corporate investigation, intelligence and investigator consultancy. Then next to him is Vega, who I think you may already uh, uh, know, uh, V. Linger, who's um, the managing director uh, at Omnibridge. He's been, like me, a litigator and also uh, in litigation funding for over 30 years, began his career at Allen and Overy. He was also, for a period of time, an officer in the uh, intelligence service of the Royal Dutch uh, Army. Um, then next to Vega is Rebecca. So Rebecca started her career uh, in the restructuring department at Linklaters. Uh, she's been with uh, King Street, which is a global asset manager since 2018. And amongst uh, other work that she does, she um, does transactions in this alternative asset class, such as litigation funding. And then right at the far end is Nick. So Nick Moore, uh, director at Aon, he started his career uh, at CMS. He then spent six very happy years at Ethereum, and he's now at Aon with responsibility for placing litigation and contingent risks. So that's your panel for um, the next several minutes. So Vega, let me come to you first, if I may. What are we actually talking about? So we're talking about enforcement funding. Omni does that as a standalone product. Tell us what the difference is between enforcement funding and merit funding. Thank you, Jane. Um, so, first of all, the definition of enforcement funding. It, um, it, it used to be the funding of all claims that are undisputed by and large and have enforcement as their main risk. Since uh, we're managing outside capital since about now six years, uh, we've had to change that into a claim that actually has an award or a judgment. It doesn't mean there's no set aside or annulment still pending, but in principle there's an executable, uh, enforceable title. Um, so um, that uh, title and that, the, let's say, the, the, the following uh, uh, actions that need that that you require to be done are uh, recognition and execution of assets that's basically the two things you need to look at um, so recognition obviously uh, is is so enforcement is sometimes used really in the sense of execution only but really we dev divide it into uh, recognition and enforcement so what kind of cases that does that entail so we have uh, traditionally funded, so from the late 80s through the 90s, we funded a lot of cases against sovereign or quasi-sovereign counterparties. So that was, let's say, the state of Iraq, but also Rashid, Rafidine, uh, CBI, those uh, typical sort of state-owned banks that have, by and large, sort of a sovereign risk. Um, then there's the fraud cases, which we don't do so much. I think Burford does a bit more fraud-related uh, stuff than we do. Uh, but we have our share of fraud stuff. And then there's the Dallas and Dynasty practice, as we call it. Uh, those are, let's say, the family-oriented trust and uh, family disputes and uh, high-value uh, divorce cases, which we do quite a lot of, uh, of with uh, Alistair here in London. Um, the difference with normal funding is basically that enforcement funding consists of both the funding of the external costs and the services that you provide as a funder. So with only Bridgeway, we have an in-house asset tracing and intelligence division that does use outside, uh, uh, let's say, asset tracers as well, but they have a different assignment with us with a normal, uh, let's say, a normal case, an outside asset tracer would basically do all the asset tracing, and in our case, we do most of the asset tracing and ask specific questions that we don't know, that they are better at than we are, or uh, because we have a capacity issue that we outsource, uh, but we still coordinate a lot. So in terms of um, the activity that you sell, it's not just the costs of the law firm, it's also 
the, uh, the coordination and strategizing services. Uh, the stuff that you actually in your introduction quite um, eloquently already laid out on the table that need to be done. Um, so that is the, uh, probably the main difference with, uh, with standard funding, that is really only the cost of the, the fund that, that does the case on the merits. One other element that is different in that coordination is that we tend to use five, six different law firms. Unless the law firm that handled the case and brought the case to us has skilled officers around the, the, the uh, jurisdictions that we need to go to, uh, in about 80 to 90 percent of the enforcement cases, it is a multi-jurisdictional effort. You have to go to all kinds of places. There where the assets are, right? And it may not be in the place where um, White and Gaze or whatever law firm or Brown Rudnick has an office uh, with the right skilled uh, operators because it may be Liechtenstein or it may be Spain, France, uh, Switzerland and so on. Yeah, and as Morris said earlier, it's not only where the assets are, isn't it? It's also where the data is, because of course, yeah. data is the new oil. <laughs> yeah. That that is as valuable, isn't it, as actually yeah, finding correct. the assets? Um, so, in, in essence, um, enforcement funding is that the, the the pickup point is later, and the nature and scope of the work that you'll get involved in is much wider, because it's not just funding the lawyers; it's actually also assisting quite literally hands-on with the asset tracing. Yes, so it, and, and then immediately the, the question I always get, only from UK lawyers actually, never from a continental lawyer, but from UK lawyers I get the question, how about control? And uh, the answer always is, look, this is a team effort. We need you as a lawyer, we need the client who always has a lot of information, but he doesn't know that he has the information. So you need to get that out of the client on assets, on all the dealings they did in the past with the defendant. Um, so it is really a team effort. Uh, and in that sense, there is no real control issue. The judge has already ruled on the case, maybe with the exception of stuff that is still subject to annulment or setting aside. So there we, we are more careful. Uh, but we can still do a lot of work. Um, and then uh, the original law firm that does the annulment still is in control of that particular element of the litigation. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to resist the urge to leap to Neil immediately in respect to obviously the client has information, which obviously is a really good point. So I'm going to keep that. So um, in terms of then, um, what else do you, just as a quick question, this may be too detailed, but do, would you also fund the assessment of the law firm's costs, obviously the cost of getting the judgment <laughs> often runs uh, to you know, millions and millions of pounds, that that by itself can be a huge claim. Would you then also fund the detailed assessment of those costs so that you get a second judgment on which you can get interest and then you enforce that? What is the assessment? So that's in essence the, the cost that the winner gets the costs paid but obviously they have to be assessed because the loser ah, right. is resisting yeah. no, that's anything. Not, yeah, that, well, that ties into the monetization element yeah. in general. I think paying advances on awards and judgments is what we do increasingly. We, we've done that already in the 90s with all these sovereign cases because that was very often the structure. Uh, but so these assessment cases are done um, advances on or, or uh, also uh, stuff that, uh, so past, past invoices that haven't been paid uh, because the, the client couldn't pay them anymore or whatever reason. So there's, there's a backlog of work that needs to be paid to the law firms. We, we can cover that. Yeah. But it's, everything has a cost, obviously, so that will have yeah. to be yeah. paid back out of the recoveries. Sure. Not to be forgotten sometimes, though, that yeah. that second judgment can actually be quite cheap to get and obviously yeah. be really quite meaningful in terms of size and obviously interest on top. Um, thanks, Vega. Let me just quickly, I'm very mindful of time. Gosh, it evaporates so quickly. So, Nick, you obviously have experience on both sides, having just come from relatively from Ethereum and now to Aon. Is there anything you wanted to add to what Vega said? If I said no, it would be a very short panel, wouldn't it? So I think <laughs> I've agreed, I agree with Vega that um, merits opportunities, there is real risk in the merits, obviously, um, liability, causation, or, or quantum. And a fund has identified that risk and is willing to back the claim and, and take the risk. With pure enforcement, I think Vega used for saying that you already have the judgment or the award, but the defendant or judgment debtor uh, refuses voluntarily to honour it. 
and they're funded back to team effectively to affect you know, a global enforcement strategy. I suppose we all know matters are never that simple, but that's probably a fair summary of the differences in the different types of different types of case. So take for example where we at Aon are seeing a real interest from our legal assets client base. Um, and this is um, what we call kind of capital wraps. And if they're uninitiated, that means essentially wrapping a collection of uncorrelated litigation investments for funders or contingency fee cases for law firms with an insurance policy, which basically says if these cases do not produce at least X pounds of investment returns or contingency fees, the policy will true the funder or the law firm up to X in coverage. Now, in underwriting, what insurers are really looking at is the point at which, during the policy term, they're going to come off risk. And so from Aon's perspective, as brokers, we need to target, or where it doesn't exist, develop insurance capacity with the relevant skill and expertise to underwrite and take on these risks. And so in the enforcement context, that means specific legal expertise and appreciation of the various strands of enforcement proceedings, so legal discovery, insolvency law, cross-border, recognition of judgments, asset attachments and sovereign immunity, and often with the willingness within a portfolio to ensure cases in both common and civil law jurisdictions. So it's a pretty broad skill set when you compare that simply to merits funding, where really it's a focus on single jurisdictions and a specific area of law and expertise. And so as brokers, I guess, our value, in addition to structuring solutions, is being aware of which markets like which risks and whether that be the credit market, the AT market, or the contingent risk market, or the political risk market, and building programs which match the strategic objectives of our client. And I think as a final point, I'd say there is litigation um, capacity out there in the market, but it's all about alignment. I think historically there's been a perception in the insurance market that they have been used to facilitate funder upside and do that for insurance pricing. That can't be the ask, but if there is true alignment and proper structuring, then there is a huge amounts of capital out there to play in funding and enforcement risks. Great, thanks, thanks Nick. So Rebecca, what's your perspective from an investor's perspective? Yeah, look, I'd say from my perspective, um, my comments will be not that dissimilar to, to Nicole Weger, which you would expect. But um, I'd say that the, the, the differences for me in any event, and, and from kind of a true investor's perspective, I think, between traditional, what I call sort of traditional claim litigation funding versus enforcement funding are really around how you look at merits and outcome and how you look at time frame for recovery. I think on the most simple level, if you think about sort of merits outcome, a traditional litigation funding, you focus on the merits, you get your legal opinion, you look at the case, you feel comfortable on the merits. From an enforcement perspective, whilst merits are still you know, very important, you need to feel comfortable there, and, and to Riga's point, it's not always 100% clear if there's gonna be an annulment risk or an appeal risk. Actually, from an investment perspective, what we really are focused on is ability to pay and how can you drive ability to pay and how do you think about your counterparty's capacity to pay. And those, to be honest, are really the important conversations that you know we at King Street would have internally and I think any other investor would too. And so whilst we've all had probably many situations kind of across our desks where there's a great claim, it's a great case, you, from a legal perspective, really want to back it, Actually, if you can't get recovery, it's, it's really not something that's that interesting. So to where's merits is, I think, really an interesting one to think about as, as a difference between the two. I think the other big difference that we think about is time frame for recovery. Again, when you're underwriting a kind of more traditional litigation funding claim, it's easier, so to speak, to be able to look at a time horizon of the claim is going to take two years, it's going to take three years, it's going to take five years. You're factoring in one or two appeal processes. And you can take a fairly reasonable assessment about what that time horizon looks like. If you're thinking about enforcement funding, that is far harder for the reasons that everyone has outlined um, and for the obvious reasons out there. The reason that um, investors and sort of funders are coming into the enforcement side is because it's a challenging asset class. If, if a defendant was going to pay, they would pay. 
And so that sort of time horizon is actually very difficult to quantify. And from an underwrite perspective, what that means is that you can't just underwrite it up front and then leave the situation and think, oh, I'll come back in three years' time and I'll get my money. You actually are always kind of continuously underwriting that, that investment, that case, and that strategy. And that feeds into how you manage with the partners that you work with on an enforcement side as to whether that is asset tracers, intelligence gatherers, law firms, across different jurisdictions, how you want to approach that case. And I think from an investor's perspective, it means that every dollar you spend out the door is critical and your underwrite is always evolving to see how your recovery will ultimately play out. Yes, yeah, there's sort of the merit shift, isn't it, in respect to sort of merits and also the court's more ready to help you because you've, sat, you've got a judgment. But of course, uh, then actually trying to find the assets. But of course, it may not just be that you can't find assets. It may also be that the problem isn't with the judgment debtor, so to speak. It's just that the judgment creditor, they've perhaps taken four or five years to get this judgment. They've been through all of the appeals. Their business is now in a state where they just can't keep going. Yeah. And that's the other factor, isn't it? The other opportunity. Yeah, to factor yeah in. very much so, very much. Okay, very good. Thanks, Rebecca. So um, just moving quickly on to just thinking about some of the typical enforcement uh, defences and how they're overcome. Omni, just in your 30 years experience of uh, being a litigator, enforcer, a, a litigation funder, what are some of the typical challenges that you see uh, if you perhaps cluster together the, the common ones rather than talk about yeah. the outliers? Yeah, so, so there's basically three. It's procedural, uh, sovereign immunity, and asset ownership. Those are the three that consistently come back. Uh, procedural can be the service of documents that is contested and, uh, look, I didn't know about it, uh, and uh, all kinds of other uh, stuff that can happen. Uh, we increasingly use, um, let's say, discovery and disclosure mechanisms, uh, both in the UK as well as in the US, like 1782 that you already said, Jane, uh, but also CHIPS uh, discovery uh, that, uh, that is with, with, with all the banks that disclose whatever transactions they have been engaged in with the defendant. Uh, so there's all kind of procedural stuff that you can do as a defendant uh, to counter that or prolong it and so on. Sovereign immunity, uh, for us, with the sovereign practice still being so, so dominant, uh, is something that constantly comes back, and we have written really uh, PhD studies on sovereign immunity uh, just by necessity of having to study it in all these different jurisdictions uh, that we have to go through. So Switzerland has uh, the requirement of a nexus with the Swiss legal sphere. So if you attach assets of a sovereign, you get a, a different treatment than a non-sovereign, which they still need, they still require a nexus, but the test is slightly different. Uh, in some jurisdictions, they look at the, uh, let's say, the, uh, the asset itself that has a destination, a public destination, then it's immune. And in some other jurisdiction, they look at the origin of the asset being immune or not. Uh, there's, of course, uh, the United Nations uh, uh, regulation on, uh, that does not mean ratified by everybody, but still is sort of used as a is sort of a conduit towards interpretation of, uh, of the sovereign immunity rules, but that's also quite fluid. I think the UK has, in the latest uh, uh, Supreme Court decisions, made with a distance the best, uh, the best assessment of sovereign immunity, what the origin is, what the reason is why you have it, and so on. Thank God for the, for the UK judiciary in that sense. It's very costly, but sometimes you get really top, top quality. Um, Shall I quickly step in there and say another, yeah. another resource that the, the, the uh, amazing UK judges have, in terms of enforcement, so there's a, a, the commercial courts around the world, uh, they've, the judges have uh, established something called CIFOC, and they've produced uh, a really fantastic um, uh, clustering together of enforcement throughout about 28 different jurisdictions. And when you read that analysis done by judges, commercial judges around the world, um, it, what you're just saying, that it's so interesting because there's so many common issues and problems. There's obviously then some really <laughs> odd little tweaks, sort of like, for example, China, that you have to get on with your enforcement, otherwise it perishes within two years. And it's that kind of thing, I think, which comes back to what I was saying at the beginning, isn't it? In terms of enforcement, it is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. But it's, it's going to be challenging if you don't know what you're doing, 
and it's an opportunity if you do, and you're willing to actually realise that it's not going to be sort of a green ski run. It's going to be off-piece black, maybe, but it's okay if you're an accomplished skier. Yeah, there's, so. there's, there's an interesting development currently with the, the whole, you know, let's say, the Ukrainian war. Yes. Um, is that originally uh, Putin initiated a lot of defences on the back of the Yukos, the execution of the Yukos uh, award, mm -hmm. the 50 billion, right? And so in France, for instance, we used to follow a certain procedure to get uh, assets attached from sovereigns. And suddenly, uh, apparently, there's a letter being sent by Putin directly to the Elysee that says, if you cannot guarantee the sovereignty of my assets in your country, I cannot guarantee the sovereignty of your assets or people in Russia. So then suddenly, the loi Putin, as it's called, uh, is uh, in, in, the, in the corridors, of course, not officially, uh, which means that now you have to uh, ask for permission from the ministry in France in order to get your uh, attachment uh, order. And the same happened in Belgium and in the Netherlands that was already not due to Putin, but due to a, a Chile case that actually we funded in, at the yeah. time. So that will, I'm very curious to see how yeah. that will evolve now that we've seen what the unfree world does to the free world yeah. and how we maybe have become more awake that sovereign immunity is basically only abused. It's, I cannot name you any case where I found that, in, of, of, that we funded where sovereign immunity was a really valid solid defense that I could agree with. All right. Thank you for that, Vega. Yeah, sorry. A bit <laughs> so, of politics there. So, Neil, <laughs> let, let me come to you because I'm mindful of, of time. So, in terms of the enforcement funding team, as Vega said, it, it's a team sport. There's no I in team. So, what are you doing as the uh, intelligence gathering uh, arm of the enforcement team? Tell us what you're doing. What's your role? How do you do it? What's data? What is, mm. If you had to choose between one data in terms of data, public data, mm. human intelligence, because you only got three minutes and you've got three minutes, what would you choose? Lots of questions. I'd choose all of them. Um, <laughs> look, I mean, we do, we do whatever we can, and which means that there's no way of industrializing or systemizing um, this kind of work. It can't be reduced to a process. So at one end, that means that you can't just have teams of people who, who follow a process book. And at the other end, you can't have sort of rogue, rogue operators who are doing things like breaking into bank accounts, which is to say that it is a, um, a, a sort of a handmade product. It's something that requires um, imagination and application. <laughs> Uh, a small team has to look at the question from a, a global perspective and follow all of the leads and integrate them on a global basis. So whether those leads are open sources in all the relevant languages, sources that appear to be closed but can be open in a legitimate way, um, and human sources, and then extra assets like things like satellite imagery and surveillance. Um, and then you, you put all of that together um, I think it's something that's very difficult to scale. Uh, and, you know, there are endemic uh, low standards in, in some of the companies in the industry. None of those present. I know some of our competitors are. I'm mm -hmm. not talking about you. Um, it, it needs to be done on a, on a creative uh, basis by small teams that are highly committed. Uh, and presumably increasingly blockchain, so forth, who are yeah. very techy, so they're able to. Yeah, I well, mean, human intelligence obviously super important, but obviously, uh, as Vega said earlier, the client has got a lot of information. The client's got information about potentially the email addresses. Well, of course, with email addresses, you can yeah. find a lot of information, financial information, banking information. There's a lot of data you can run, isn't it? That's to try right. and find the needle in the haystack. Yeah, and you know, from our point of view, if we're doing this kind of exercise, the most important thing is to share as much as possible um, with, with the client and vice versa so that we are properly briefed at the beginning that everything is shared with us. Um, and often the client doesn't know how much they know. 
and that we're, that we're looped in, uh, not just on what the strategy is, but ideally on the formulation of the strategy and the sequencing of things that are going to happen on the legal front that doesn't, that doesn't hinder us and ideally helps us. I'll give you uh, just a, an anecdotal example. On the information sharing front, we were working on a, an asset trace for a, a high-profile divorce. And after quite a long while of, uh, of investigation, we discovered that, that the gentleman in question owned a, a very lavish Riyadh hotel in the mountains in Morocco. So we, we thought we'd done incredibly well um, to discover this hotel, which is worth millions. And we came back to the client and she said, oh, I always thought it was funny. My husband used to take me there twice a year and he always behaved as if he was the owner. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you'd like to share? Um, so, uh, so, you know, it's not the, the work that we do. I mean, you can treat it as a kind of an add-on, but I don't think it, it really is in anyone's interest to do it that way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, mindful of time, Nick. Um, what solutions are available for award monetization through insurance? This is where it gets really interesting, isn't it? <laughs> so, you assume Brown Rudnick is a client with a judgment for 100 million pounds. Everyone's popping champagne corks after judgment, um, but no one in reality is seeing any money for years down the line until the case has made its way through the post-trial motions or the appellate process those processes could see the judgment reversed or significantly reduced on appeal. Where we have seen demand from our clients is in relation to what's called judgment preservation insurance, which allows a prevailing claimant to lock in value up to a certain floor. So say you put in place a £75 million JPI policy with a £25 million deductible on a £100 million judgment, pound judgment sorry. if that judgment gets wiped out on appeal, the insurance will pay £75 million. If that judgment gets halved in appeal, the insurance will pay out 25, you know, with that 25 deductible there on top. And so while JPI is an extremely useful tool for locking in value and taking some chips off the table, I guess, it can all be used to, also be used to monetize a judgment on extremely cost-effective terms. So again, same example, 100 million judgment, the JPI policy for 75 million pounds. If there's no real collection risk associated with the judgment because it's considered that the defendant has or will have sufficient assets to cover the judgment within the jurisdiction of each of the court. Then once you have the JPI policy, you've effectively turned that contingent asset into a guaranteed one. So the claimant now knows it's going to end up with £75 million no matter what happens, right? So if the judgment is affirmed, the claimant gets £100 million from the defendant. If the judgment is zeroed, it gets £75 million from the insurers. And if the judgment is reduced to, say, 25, million, they get £25 million from the defendant and 50 from the insurance policy. And because the appellate risk, therefore, is removed with JPI, or it's at least capped, the plaintiff is only facing durational risk. So it's still an open question as to when the case will pay. But either the defendant or the insurer, or a combination of both, will. And so an insured judgment holder can raise capital backed by a combination of the judgment and the policy at a very attractive rate. And so in that sense, insurance back monetization can be seen as a competitor to a sort of typical uninsured litigation finance deal, uh, where a funder cuts the claimant who has a £100 million award of water check for 25 to 40, who can keep that money if they lose an appeal, but has to pay it back at a multiple if it wins, or is affirmed an appeal. But it's also a complement to funding, because once a funded case has resulted in a lower court judgment, we can ensure not only the claimant's share, but also the funder's share, and also the contingency fee-based share for the law firm. And we can do that simply to ensure it, or as I say, to take some chips off the table and cost-effectively monetize. So quite an interesting product. Thanks, Nick. Rebecca, do you want to just quickly say in a minute, speak about, <laughs> or maybe two, uh, speak about um, monetization from the investor's perspective? Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, so look, I think monetization is, is, as we talked about before, sort of building on those comments, it's, it's key from an investor's perspective. Time frame around that is key as well. I think all investors have a cost of capital that varies across investors um, and have time frames on which they're working within. You know, some funds have closed-ended funds, some are open-ended funds. It, you know, drives their perspective of how quickly they need to get that capital back. And, and that will indirectly then drive the strategy of recovery around enforcement. So whether you are more focused on 
and, and making sure you have alignment of interest with those you're working with on recovering quicker, potentially for a lower amount, or whether you're willing to kind of play the long game and, and go for the, for the ultimate full recovery longer term and face the high costs that go with that. I think, you know, every investor is a little bit different on that basis. You know, from a King Street perspective, I think we have reasonable cost of capital, um, but we have open and closed-ended funds. So we're very flexible in the way that we look about opportunity sets um, and how we think about how we want to underwrite and, and drive a strategy from our perspective. Um, but coming back to some of the comments that, that the team have made, I think, really, and this is echoes something that was said in a couple of other of the earlier sessions, for us, when we look about monetization, when we look about structure, when we look about how we underwrite an investment, um, we're always thinking about how we drive alignment of interest with the parties that we're working with, and whether that's council, whether that's asset tracers, whoever it may well be, it's always about driving that alignment of interest to ensure that we've got that recovery in the way that, from an King- investor and a King Street perspective, we want to see. Yeah, and trying to get a strategy of getting some low-hanging fruit, get some injunctions, get disclosure. Yes, great. Well, look, uh, I'm going to ask you each, just say 30 seconds each, to just give us, uh, the audience, each of you, what developments you anticipate coming up in terms of enforcement funding, monetization. You can do it in one word, two words, 30 seconds each. Vega, I'll start with you. Ah, all right. Um, You've got the countdown, so you yeah. can count your 30 seconds down. Yeah, I see monetization of, um, l- let's say, relatively exotic claims increasing. At least it's, it's what I see a lot of questions, get a lot of questions about also because we are seen as the enforcement specialist. Uh, not the cases that uh, Nick is talking about. For that, you get, always get a better pricing through uh, Aon, uh, I think, but it is the stuff that they wouldn't insure because it has a unclear duration risk and um, it is uh, with Ris- all, uh, fraught Ris- with all kinds of opportunity. enforcement issues. Okay, Nick, come to you, 30 seconds. <clears throat> so a cliffhanger for the funding market. I think that in the future the same sort of principles that drive insurance back monetization may also be applied to cases that haven't yet been filed to provide funding for those cases. So take a nascent group of cases, demonstrate to insurers those cases are likely to return X in value and then put a policy in place in that amount, then you can use that policy to raise finance to fund your litigation. And that's happening now in the CAT on certain cases and quite an interesting development, use of insurance capital uh, to fund litigation. Great. Thanks, Nick. Rebecca, what's your thoughts? Yeah, look, I think in the enforcement space, from an investor's perspective, it's going to be one, the multitude of insurance products that are be coming out into the market, which definitely changes it from an investor's perspective, how you think about an underwrite. I think the second is developments in technology um, around asset trading, intelligence gathering, like how all that plays out, and therefore, again, how that drives your underwrite. And, and You're such a fantastic panellist, Rebecca, because you segue straight into Neil, <laughs> 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 and a topic I really love as well. Neil? Um, I think the Russia-Ukraine conflict is going to throw up a a huge amount of work uh, in in our sector. On the Russian side, um, I think there's going to be a free-for-all for for Russian state assets um, by the Ukrainian state and other parties who've been affected by um, this barbarity. Um, That would be both uh, state assets, and they can form a queue behind UCOS, Um, and also the assets of oligarchs on the basis that stolen property reverts to the ownership of the party it was stolen from, which is the Russian state. And on the Ukrainian side, I don't think the Ukrainian people are going to put up with um, the kleptocrats and oligarchs who've bedeviled them for decades after the sacrifices they've made, and therefore there's going to be a free-for-all on their assets as well. Um, which have largely been stolen from the Ukrainian people. So I think that's going to keep us busy in that part of the world. Okay. Can I, I, can I add my point? I'd say just one word. The blockchain, I think, is going to just uh, revolutionise enforcement uh, uh, and obviously much more. Right. We've got one minute and one second, so I can probably take one quick question and then you've got drinks and you can ask all of the other questions over a drink. Hello. Hello, um, I'm Noor. I'm uh, an investment and commercial arbitration specialist. I also advise funds. We see a lot of repeat players in the, uh, the treaty uh, arbitration space, and we hear a lot about sovereign default insurance. I just wanted to ask Nick if mm. that, I mean, is utilised. How prevalent is it? I mean, anecdotally, I understand it has been used several times in the past. We 
don't place much of it for our clients. I think there have been some pretty big market losses, and so the insurers are maybe slightly reluctant to, to write that type of policy, but I, I, I do know that it exists, and you know, like any insurance policy, is a useful tool in the, in, in the wider arbitration strategy. It existed, and that tells you something about the viability of the product. Okay. Great. I'm going to interrupt there because it's mastermind, and I think you can still go because time isn't up. Because any one more question to quickly go in, please. I guess uh, when it comes to the two of you, um, like in cyber, forensics, and, and defence, there is a, a lot of grey space. Um, are, are you feeling uh, clients are asking for guarantees of being on the right side of ethics and law, or? Is, is that not something that, uh, that is, is yet demanded of you? I just, thought you were a courageous man to ask a question between us and the drinks, but your question is actually <laughs> very good. 30 seconds, <laughs> please, each. <laughs> uh, and, and this actually has been a question we've had already since I do this since 2000. Uh, always, look, are your measures and how you get your information, is that correct? Will it surface later and bite me in the tail? Because how did you know this? So that has always been a very uh, Im important thing to, to keep in mind. Over time, I had the feeling that it was not so necessary to ask it because a lot of the information and the assets that you want to identify, that's not really the problem. It is the combination with the legal, the legal stuff uh, that identifies it with the right uh, defendant. So that's really owned by your counterparty and not some sister company or with a similar name. And it's not suffering from sovereign immunity. So it's more the inter interaction with legal, as far, in my view. But for you, it may be different. Yeah, I mean, look, um, there are people in the market doing things like breaking into bank accounts and hacking. Uh, and, and to me, that comes not so much from a moral deficiency as a, as a lack of application and imagination. It's usually Agreed. not only is it counterproductive and against the client's interests, uh, it's usually just not necessary. So I'd, I'd look at that as a kind of amateur street thing. Agreed. Yeah, a whole topic in itself in terms of the, uh, the commercializations, uh, privatization of, of commercial spying. Good, all right, unless there's any other questions, I'm going to say thank you to you all uh, for a long day. Uh, and thank you to the amazing panel. So we have Nick, Rebecca, Vega, and Neil. Thank you very much. Just very quickly, I'd like to say a huge thank you to you all um, and to our fantastic panelists, uh, to Gary Barnett and uh, to all of you for coming. I'd also like to thank you, Brown Rodney conference team and our PR firm, Questa Consulting, for helping us to organize this panel um, and this conference. Um, a big personal thank you uh, to BR management team for supporting my initiative long before litigation funding has really blossomed in Europe. I'm very proud to work at a law firm that looks at innovative areas um, and sets market, uh, market trends um, and um, legal framework. We hope that you have found today stimulating and you, that you have had opportunity to catch up with your colleagues in the industry and to make new contacts. It has been an honor to have so many leaders uh, in the industry um, and the litigation ecosystem all together in one place. I know that some of you have flights to catch, but for those of you who don't, we'd be delighted if you join us for drinks and canapes next door. Thank you.